Hey everyone, and thank you for joining us for Above the Tree Line. We are here again with Senior Pastor Will. Can we Davis actually do Jr. one from above the tree line sometime? No, I don't Please. go above the tree line. I'm gonna stay <laughs> right be, here with my feet. That's all the more reason to get you above tree line and see what happens. Lack of oxygen would be fascinating. <laughs> Hi friends, thanks for joining us. Sorry, so we, we digress. digress. Welcome. Uh, so today we <laughs> have an awesome question that we've mm. gotten from multiple people that I weren't sure if we were going to dive into this just yet, but it is a question about Christian's relationship with guns. Specifically... Can y'all please send questions about like how to have a quiet time or how long is now have, before it becomes then? We have then. those too, but this Did is Did Adam more have exciting. a belly button? Much easier than the stuff you're giving us right this now. This is Sorry. about the ethical challenges of gun ownership mm. for Christ followers. So... I'm assuming that most of the people watching this are familiar with the Second Amendment rights in America, but I do know that we have an international audience, so I'm just going to go ahead and let you guys know that our amendment says that we, the right of the people, we have the right to keep and bear arms, and that right shall not be infringed. So basically, our Constitution says that we can possess firearms unconnected to the militia. This is just individuals' rights to bear arms in America. So I want to give you a couple statistics before we dive into this from a biblical perspective, because I was reading from the Pew Research Center that uh, white evangelicals are more likely than any other religion to own guns. This is 41% of white evangelicals are gun owners. And the primary reason for owning a gun in their perspective is because it makes them feel safer. However, Americans who attended religious services weekly are less likely to own a gun, only 27% of those people. So there seems to be some sort of disparity between people who identify as Christ followers owning guns and people who actually attend church regularly. That number drops significantly if you attend church. Why do you think there is a discrepancy? Let me point out how these? much I love this podcast so far because Lauren's doing all the talking. I know. I, I've got I a really, lot of notes. I, I just, you keep going, gonna, girl. <laughs> you're doing I, great. I could go on and on about this. You I could fill the whole 20 minutes out, myself. Sis. But why do you think there is such a disparity between people who attend church regularly versus people who don't attend church regularly and gun ownership? Why do evangelicals, I tend to think, are mostly men? And I think Anglo men me being one of them, think gun gun open, owning as a hobby is a pretty cool thing. Wait, white evangelicals you think are mainly men? I think more there are more white evangelicals that are male than female. Totally. Hmm. I think it's a male thing. Nothing wrong with it. I think it's a guy thing. Okay. That would identify themselves as white evangelical, more men than women will. And I think guys, white guys think guns are cool. I'm being mm -hmm. totally racist in that. I know that. But I'm one of them. They, they, can, they have the... the some of them have the discretionary income to buy guns. They're not cheap. And for many of them, it's just a hobby. Mm -hmm. You go to church, and you get in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and you hear Jesus talking about things like, do not resist an evil person in Matthew. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there's, there, and I feel it in me as a gun owner. You feel I, conviction. I feel it in me that I don't know that what I would do if it's just me. I think I know what I would do if it was my family. But if it's just me, those words of Jesus, don't resist an evil person, I might be handing him a four spiritual laws instead of pulling my gun mm. because of that conviction. So there's a real tension. We're not going to solve... Let me just give you the bottom line. We're not going to solve any problems today on this one, okay? Um, because there really is a tension with, between our Constitution and... And the Old Testament, which is even different from the New Testament. And so, we're, we're, you know, we'll see. You're getting ahead of me there because okay. I do have this well, divided that's what I'm trying into to Old finish Testament this. I'm and trying New to finish Testament. This quickly. No, we're going to fill up this uh, whole okay. session. Here we go. It's funny because I was having this conversation with my husband this morning, and his whole thing about guns is they're fun. You go out to the ranch, yeah, they are you fun. shoot at targets. What are the little things that you shoot in the air and you go boom? Yeah, clay. <laughs> Clay, yeah. you shoot, shoot clay, skeet. You shoot skeet. Um, and it's fun, you shoot skeet. and it's enjoyment. And he's like, I don't need to shoot living things. I just enjoy the guns. So I know for many, it is a hobby. Um, and then that kind of begs the question, is this a hobby that Christians should be partaking in or not? Um, because like Paul says, all things are permissible, not, not all, all things, things are, are beneficial. beneficial. Right. I feel like we say that in every episode. But um, let's start by going back into the Old Testament. The Just the most 
outstanding thing I can think of is in the commandments, thou shalt mm -hmm. not murder. The purpose of guns is pretty much to kill something, whether it's an animal or another human being. If you're using it for self-defense, the result of that could be murder. The commandment says thou shalt not murder, but this kind of, oh, this is this tension. It seems there's so many other verses in the Old Testament that almost justify murder in a way because Exodus 22, if a thief is found breaking in and is beaten to death, no blood guilt is incurred. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's just not helpful. Um, it, it gets into, to, again, the governmental authority and individual authority, but there clearly is if a death is brought on by accident or by, in that case, defense, it's not punishable. So um, I feel as a hu husband and a father, a property owner, a responsibility to protect. That's what shepherds do. Mm -hmm. And one of the images in the scriptures is of Jesus as a shepherd. The shepherds defended the flocks against wolves, against thieves, etc. Um, to the point of death, they did mm -hmm. that. So I don't have any issue, Lauren, if I wake up some night and there's something really ugly going down in my house, I don't think, I haven't experienced it yet, I have an issue defending my wife. I've never had to do it. I've had some close calls, but I've never had to actually defend my wife from someone trying to hurt her, harm her. And I, I think I know how I respond to that. And mm -hmm. I think I'd probably use violence to do it, right or wrong. Again, if it's just me, I may just say, well, you said, thanks for sending me to heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm going. I don't know what I would do. But I do think we have a I, – I believe there's biblical grounds to answer your question um, for shepherding my home, and that includes defending my home if I have to from those who would bring harm to the people I'm responsible for. Mm -hmm. I think I'm on – I think I'm on biblical grounds with that. And we always reserve the right to be We wrong. always reserve the right to change our um, minds next week. Because I kind of divided this, the gun ownership into hunting, right? Like providing for your family, law enforcement, self-defense. And then, of course, there's just murder. And I feel like there's biblical grounds for law enforcement, like, of course. Of course. Um, but then when it comes to self-defense, well, I feel like that's the one. Can we answer that? Because yeah. even that is being pushed on in our culture. Right. So both Testaments talk about the power of the sword mm -hmm. being given to government. Otherwise, you're going to have anarchy and you're going to have chaos. And so it's, Paul says in Romans 13, the government has the sword ability, like the ability to bring punishment for a reason, and it's to protect the innocent, to uh, oppose those who would be in bringing injustice, and punish them if necessary. Now, do governments... Um, abuse that right in some countries, 100%. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. But the, this Bible does give that right for police officers mm -hmm. with the state authority behind them to protect its citizenry. That's a biblical thing. It's not, so we're not being, police mm -hmm. can make mistakes and be thugs like everybody else can. But it's not unbiblical to have a police force that defends the innocent. That's a biblical concept. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of getting into what we're going to dive into next week, which is going to be capital punishment. So taking Goodness the government gracious, out of topics, it, these two topics these do topics go hand in hand. So we are going to dive more into the government's authority to institute capital are punishment. Are these really the questions people send us? Absolutely. Can y'all please like go on vacation or something? <laughs> Man. Y'all are killing They're me. They're fascinating. So <laughs> some people would say, you know, Jesus were, like tells us to be peacemakers. There isn't very much that's peaceful about automatic weapons, for example. And the verse that you were quoting when you were saying that we, um, I don't know which verse that you were just quoting a second ago, but it's it's along the lines of we're required to be peacemakers. We're required to resist evil. Yeah, to meet the Sermon on the Mount. Does that mean that we are welcoming martyrdom? That's a great question. I do not know. Okay. Um, because I, I think it gets more complex, Lauren, when you think about persecution and the, the countless number of Christians who um, did not resist Rome mm -hmm. um, or China or pick your thuggish government that has opposed Christians. And when instead of resisting, um, they gladly gave their lives sacrificing for Christ. Um, and didn't raise up arms against an evil government. They said, okay, if you want to kill us, you can kill us. 
Then you've got Diedrich Bonhoeffer, hmm. one of the greatest biblical scholars who ever lived, was actually involved in a plot to kill Hitler. Yeah. And, and he's, hailed, he's heralded as a hero for that. Bonhoeffer is lifted up by Christians as this great man who was fighting for the Jews, fighting against evil, and believed it was his God-given duty to take out Hitler. Right. So good luck with that. I mean, that's, that's the extreme we're on. Right. That's, that's the extreme yeah. we're on. And so you're, we're not going to solve it. No. And it, it is, it's a very divisive issue, especially among Christians in particularly um, between the two parties. It's a very partisan yeah, issue between Democrats so. and Republicans. There are Christians in both parties that feel very strongly about this, and they also defend it a lot of times based on their faith. So it's almost like you can use your faith to justify either position, which the more that I dove into the scripture, um, the more kind of confusing it becomes because as Jesus is about to get arrested, he and his disciples go and he instructs them to basically bring protection, bring swords. And I think it's Peter that says, we have two. And Jesus says, it's that's enough. enough. So it, it, what Jesus wasn't saying, every single one of you needs to have a sword. He was saying two is enough, which implies that he had no intention of them using the swords for self-defense, murder. Yeah, I, I got a problem with that passage. I, okay. don't th I don't think that's what Jesus was doing there. And I don't know what he was doing there, but I, don't, I think people have used that passage to defend bearing arms. You don't need to use that passage to defend bearing arms. Because, again, when Peter starts swinging his sword in Gethsemane, Peter, Jesus said, stop. Mm -hmm. This is crazy. Those who live by the sword die by they the sword. They will die by the sword. They will. I, so I, I, people use that passage to say Jesus endorsed bearing of arms. I, don't, I think that's a bad interpretation. Um, you don't need that passage to f find the right in Scripture to defend your house. By the way, assault weapons, mm -hmm. just because we you mentioned that a minute mm -hmm. ago. It, it's only an assault weapon if you use it to assault someone. Okay. But it's a pretty extreme no, it is, it weapon. Is, it is an, like, it is, what would be the purpose for it, owning an assault weapon? I think a like person an that would use an assault weapon would be up against unbelievable odds mm -hmm. and unbelievable numbers where a pistol's not going to get it done. Right. And you don't ever want to be in that situation. But you can you can turn anything into a assault weapon if you use it to assault right. people. Yeah, it could be a car. A baseball bat can be yeah. an assault weapon. It could be a car. Absolutely. They have been. It, it's it's the purpose. It's it's the, I'm showing a bit of my political hand here, and please don't hold me guilty for my politics because they, they shouldn't come into bearing. But um, it's the heart that's the problem. Mm -hmm. It's not the baseball bat. It's not the knife. It's not the guy driving the car or flying the airplane in the tower. Mm -hmm. It's the heart that's evil, and and you can ban guns. That's fine. You can make. I'm all. For, I'm all for making it harder to get guns. I have no problem with that. Make, tightening up the restrictions, making sure we know who's got them and who doesn't. But if you take guns off the streets, it'll be the next thing because the heart hasn't changed. Right. And that's the problem we're dealing with. We're getting off under the topic here, but but we're not going to fix it by taking away. Because again, people used airplanes. Right. 9-11, second bloodiest day in U.S. history on our soil mm -hmm. behind Pearl Harbor. We didn't outlaw airplanes. Mm -hmm. But we put restrictions in place, and that has not happened we, again. We did, and it's not happened again. And I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. I'm all for it. So I'm going to go back to Jesus real let's go, quick. That's a good answer. Yeah. That's a bumper sticker. That let's is, go back to Jesus. Let's go back to Jesus. Country Western song. <laughs> go back to Jesus. So Luke 22. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Now, let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. Why? I don't know. I do not know. There are many, I mean, there's many purposes, yes, again, many, that they would have a sword to mm -hmm, defend the flock mm -hmm. for hunting. Um, but Jesus is saying, sell your cloak I, and go I, buy a sword. I, the interpretations I have read of that were like, be ready to take on the Gentiles, and I don't buy that. That feels inconsistent with me to what he was teaching the disciples to be. So I, I believe in my spirit there's something else going on in that passage, and I haven't figured it out yet, but it sounds inconsistent with the rest. Again, let the difficult passages be seen in a lot of the clear ones. No other place in Scripture did Jesus say, go get a weapon. And he's never, and he says, resist, don't resist evil people. Turn the other cheek. So when you've got that conflicting Scripture, mm -hmm. I think there's one passage has to yield to the others, and I want to put that passage about go go sell your clothes and get two swords. I want to put that passage at the feet of the other ones and think there's got to be something else going on here. And I just don't know what it is yet. 
Hmm. But I don't really think Jesus is saying, hey, you all need a weapon, because he didn't model it, he didn't practice it, and he didn't say it anywhere else, as far as I know. Right. I think it's inconsistent, and I think that means there's got to be something else happening. Right. Stay tuned for future podcasts to know what it is, because right now I have no clue. Right. Well, it is. It's it's really <laughs> difficult, because I feel like especially Christians in America, like we... We identify as Christ followers, but American is a very proud, like very proud heritage. And these are rights given to us by the government. And the reason for the Second Amendment right was to make sure that in America, this new country they were founding, that the government um, couldn't turn against the civilians. Um, and also that if the civilians needed to form a militia, yeah, they, they had the to ability arms. to do so. They didn't have an army back then. So then you look at what's happening in Ukraine right now. So... Ukraine needs to be able to defend itself against Russia. So they they need to have access to weapons. So that it does beg the question, like, it, could what's happening in Ukraine happen in America if Americans are the most armed yeah. of all the civilians? It would take longer, that's for sure. Also, you know, it, I don't want to be in a firefight, like, if something ever breaks out because everybody's carrying and nobody's trained. Exactly. And it's going to be the wild, wild west. You exactly. Put your head down. So let me tell you a story. Um, my wife witnessed a murder mm -hmm. in eighth grade, and it was a school shooting, and it was a twenty-two rifle by a 13-year-old. Guess who doesn't do guns? Mm -hmm. My wife. So we've never had guns in our house. Fine. I'm not a hunter. Couldn't care less. Until about eight years ago, and there was a new story of yet another crime in a home. It was against a pastor's wife. Hmm. Pastor was out, somebody's watching the house, and a really ugly, violent thing happened. And Susie said, I think it's time for you to get a gun. And it was because she wants to know that if something goes really south in our home, there is some chance I have, she would never use a gun, there's some chance I have of protecting us if I'm there. And that's the most pacifist human on the planet mm -hmm. right there is my sweet bride. But she saw 911 not being enough at that point. Mm -hmm. Now, we're God-honoring, God-fearing people. And I've heard that story that I just told about my wife repeated more times than I can count mm -hmm. in the last several years as culture has deteriorated. People I know that would never previously consider owning guns, that God loved Jesus dearly, have gone and got CHLs or gone to mm -hmm. shooting class just in case. Yeah. And just in case it winds up on my doorstep. Mm -hmm. Now, you never know what you're going to do till you're in it. Exactly. So you what happens, what, what is, what's permissible when that person does arrive on your doorstep? Because in Texas... Yeah. Like wow. My emotions are welling up just thinking about this. Yeah. Yeah, you have a stand your ground, defend you your home law here in Texas. You have to pray for the discernment to know what to do. Um, you never want to take a life. You never want to harm anybody. I also have a God-given assignment to protect my flock. I just don't, I, I'm ready, I train, I don't know what I would do, Lauren. Mm -hmm. I really don't. And it, it's something I pray I never have to, or any of us listening to this podcast ever have to figure out what we're going to do. Um, because if, 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 that, if that guy's knock on your door, yeah. it's, it's just sad and it's hard. It feels almost like an arms race to a certain degree, though, because so many people have weapons. So many people have automatic weapons. And we've even seen this recently in Austin that you almost need to be armed just to be able to defend yourself yeah. against those who are armed. So it's like, oh, yeah. you've got arms. I need to go them. out and get bigger arms and more arms. And it does. It feels almost like there's an arms race in America. And this is, it feels like a very uniquely American issue, but even though Americans yeah. are more armed than other countries, I will also say that America is not even in the top four countries for gun-related violence. A lot of it's wow. happening at the southern part of North America. So we have mm -hmm. like, um, there's El Salvador, and then we have like Venezuela, South America, Brazil, yeah. um, and those countries have higher... They're less it's armed. I would but imagine Mexico is one of those. Yes, Mexico is in there as well. Cartels. So it is North America, South America, where you see the majority of gun violence. It's not the United States. We're not ranking in in the top five to six countries that are experiencing the most gun violence, um, which I also found was that was interesting because on average... Because you think we would think we are as much as an airplane yes, as it gets. Yes, because we, we get so much media coverage on it. All right, can I give you bottom line? Yes. Sister? Um... 
grace. Mm-hmm. If you're an anti-gun person, be be an anti-gun person, and and I applaud you. Um, if you're a if you're a pro-gun person, then then be responsible, and make sure you're equipped enough to be part of the solution and not part of the problem if something goes south. If something goes south, you do not want to be part of the problem because you don't know how to handle that thing in your hands. If you can't steward it really well and have it locked up and have it safe, do not own a gun. If you if you ever have to draw it, you want to know what you're doing with it and be trained enough not to just be crazy. And so be if you're going to own a gun, make sure you're equipped to be part of the solution. But we got to give grace in both directions. Mm-hmm. And those of us in the room who are gun owners need to pray for the discernment that if something ever does go south, we know what the Lord would have us do because it may not be what you think it is. Mm. You, you just don't know. So I'm asking for grace. I'm asking for wisdom and a lot of love both directions as this one's really, really tough. If you're going to own a gun, please make sure you know how to be part of the solution, mm-hmm. not part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have so many other scripture that we just didn't even. I, I stalled get as long to. as I could. There's so much more here, but some of these things will cross over into our capital our punishment. Our happy topic for our, next week. Our next week topic of capital punishment. <laughs> um, so if you guys want to hear any more about this subject, I welcome it. I'm not sure if Will does, but we can go deeper into this <laughs> if you guys want us to. Um, but we do want to encourage you to join us next week as we dive into kind of some of these other verses uh, and how they relate to capital punishment. Thank you, Will. Love you guys. For letting Thank us you, talk Lauren. about this. All right, we'll Appreciate see you y'all. guys next week.